Hi, everybody. Um, welcome. Is it okay if I stand, Karen? Is that okay? Do I throw off CUNY TV? Sorry, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm used to, you know, sitting and teaching is just not, um, uh, not my thing. Um, okay, so I'm Michael Jacobson. I am the um, executive director of the CUNY Institute for State and Local Governance and a professor of sociology here at the CUNY Graduate Center. Um, this event is co-sponsored by ISLG, the Institute, and the Graduate Center's Office of Public Programs. Uh, ISLG is a policy and research institute at CUNY. We work on issues like these uh, in New York and, in fact, around the country. We work in about 70 cities and counties on, on issues like this and other issues of government reform. The Graduate Center, I think, is probably most of you know um, uh, that our students and faculty study and research most of the important public issues today, like the one we're discussing, and we regularly offer events to help inform the public on a wide range of topics. Uh, they'll, I'll go over quickly what the uh, agenda for this is. Um, I should say this is the second in a series of events we have on jails, uh, broadly in New York City jails. The next one will be on December 8th, and that will be a, a, a discussion of what, what's the purpose of jail, uh, what should an ideal jail look like. Um, uh, and there'll be, after our discussion, there'll be time uh, for question and answers from the, um, from the audience. So let me quickly introduce the panelists um, in their order of seating. Um, the first is Jan Ransom, who's an investigative reporter for the New York Times. I think as probably most of you know, focusing on criminal justice issues, law enforcement, and incarceration in New York. Since joining the Times in 2017, she's won a variety of awards for her continuing coverage of the crisis at Rikers Island and previously covered law enforcement <clears throat> and crime for the Boston Globe. Um, sitting next to her is Judge George Grasso. Judge Grasso is a retired Supreme Court judge. When we asked him to do this, he wasn't retired, and now he is. I'm not sure if there's a relationship between those two things, but um, before his retirement, uh, he was the administrative judge for criminal matters for Queen's Supreme Court. He's also served as supervising judge for Bronx Criminal Court and was the citywide supervising judge for arraignments before becoming a judge. He worked at the NYPD for 30 years, rising to the rank of first deputy police commissioner. Um, seated on the end is Akeem Browder. Akeem is a social justice advocate and founder of the Khalif Browder Foundation. Through his work, he seeks to honor the memory of his brother, Khalif, to work with stakeholders and policymakers to change the laws, policies, and regulations that so devastate families and communities impacted by mass incarceration and solitary confinement. So welcome to you all. They all have much longer biographies, and again, if, if you're interested, look online, please. So I'm gonna open this with something I usually don't do um, in evening panels, because no one, no one really comes at the end of the day to see an, a number of uh, PowerPoint slides. Don't panic. We're going to get through this, but I, I thought it would be helpful to set some context for this discussion that we'll have, um, and just to give some historical context, some substantive context, some political context for what we're talking about and why it's so important, especially for those who are not immersed in this, as a number of us here are. Um, Okay, so quickly, and I'm gonna run through these quickly, so if you, I'll, I, and maybe some of the panelists will stay around afterwards if you have specific questions about them. I'm not, this is not a seminar, I'm not gonna spend a long time on these charts, but I, I just wanna give people a sense. So the first one, just to set some context, is the uh, New York City jail population <clears throat> since 1998. Actually, if the chart went back a few years, you'd see an even larger decrease. I mean, one of the things that characterizes in New York City system is there has been a massive decline in the population of the jail system, 70% since its height in um, 1993. 
Uh, and except for that small increase, which is a bit of a problem, in 2022, it's been a steady decline, 70%. Um, and that decline has happened at the same time the city has had the most massive declines in crime and violent crime of any large city in the country. And the, the last year, of course, where there's been rising crime in cities across the country is obviously an issue. But in historical context, one of the things New York City is known for is this huge decline in jail population and a concomitant decline in crime at the same time. To really understand it and go through it would be a series of other panels. It's not what, really what we're going to get into to, today, but I thought it was important for people um, <clears throat> to see it. This, there's a lot of stuff going on in this chart. All, all I really um, think you should focus on is that green bar um, are the percent of people who are in jail for misdemeanors. And you can see even since 2016, so the last six or seven years, uh, there's been a very large decline in the population at Rikers who is there for misdemeanors. And again, a concomitant increase in the percentage of people who are there for felonies, right? So the, the, the makeup of the jail has changed in addition to the size of the jail. Now this gets into the meat of what we're talking about today. There's a sort of, an, the iron law of jail or prison populations is about the number of people who go in and how long they stay. We're talking less today about the number of people who go in, but how long they stay and why that's a hugely important issue. And you can see in, this is New York going back 25 years, it wasn't exactly flat, um, but it was sort of flat until about 2013, 2014, and then you can see a huge increase in the average length of stay. Um, and, you know, you can see a little of that pandemic effect there, um, but as you can see, this was going up before the pandemic. This is not solely a pandemic issue, right? This is... This has been a trajectory of New York for a long time, and it's, it's really at the heart of what we're here to talk about today. Um, this just breaks that down because, as I just said, the makeup of the jail has changed. There are more felonies now, so to just to be clearer, um, both of those length of stays have gone up. You can see the misdemeanors, which should be by far the shortest length of stays, if they even should go to jail at all. Um, they've gone from an average length of stay of 20 days, more or less, um, to almost 55 days. And, you know, I'll ask Judge Grasso and someone to talk about that. That is a very long time for a Mr. Meaner case. Um, same general trend on the felonies. Um, you can see longer length of stays generally because they're felony cases. Some number of them are violent felony cases. But again, you can see starting in 2013, the huge increase, right? So this is, and we'll, we'll get to the heart of the matter in a minute, these are very consequential issues. This is not just dry policy stuff that's only um, relevant to people who spend their lives studying this. This has very real world impacts that will be the heart of what we discussed today. On the panel, again, there's a lot going on here. Don't, don't trouble yourself with looking at the details. That, that, that little pie chart on the right is the key chart here. 16, <clears throat> 26%, which is that black number on the left, 26% of everyone at Rikers now stays for one year or more. Uh, for people who know about jail systems, that is a hugely high number. I mean, hugely high. A quarter, over a quarter of the people are there for a year or more. And what that, that second pie chart shows is that 6% uh, of them stay for two to three years, 5% stay more than three years. It's, it's, real, it's unthinkable um, if you know this, and again, has just devastating impacts from a theoretical justice point of view to impacts on people who are incarcerated and their families and the conditions in the jail. I mean, one of the things we're, we're gonna try to make clear in this panel is that these, these numbers are directly related to sort of everything you read about Rikers. Violence, self-harm, suicide, use of force, stabbings and slashings, they're, they're all implicated by these numbers. No one can stay in a jail like that for two to three years and have people think things will be fine, things will not be fine. Um, and finally, and then we'll just jump right into the conversation, this is just a chart showing the current jail population, which is 5,500 right now, 
what the population would be if we went back to length of stays just a few years ago. So if people stayed as long as they did in 2017, uh, we'd cut about 2,500 people out of the jail population. That's how consequential these numbers are. And it's not like the length of stays in 2017 were so great. They weren't that great. Um, they're just a lot better than they are now. And that population uh, would, uh, there's a lot of talk about closing Rikers Island and how are we gonna get down to 3,400, which is the amount that the city has to get down to move into the borough jails. That This is one of the ways you do that. Um, okay, so, so that's, um, that's the context. And I, 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 I wanna open the, discussion because, as I said, I, I, I think it's important to not leave this at sort of a policy-centric kind of conversation and to talk about what the impacts of this are and, to, as I said, put a, a human face on this. And I think it, as a result of that, it makes sense to um, start with Akeem and ask you, Akeem, to talk a little about um, uh, uh, the Khalif's story in the in the, in the system um, and the implications for conditions, uh, length of stay, what it, what it means to have these sorts of numbers, what the human impact is, and also if you could specifically talk about how, how you now, especially through your organization, work on uh, bringing reform to the system around these issues. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, Khalid Browder, my, my youngest brother, Testing? Yeah, you're good. Okay. Um, so Khalif Browder, who was my youngest brother, youngest of nine, my mother uh, forced to care uh, children, uh, children that uh, needed a family and gave them uh, a home and loving support, as every family does. But Khalif being the youngest of all of us, he was uh, 15 at the time, uh, no, 16 at the time of his arrest, excuse me, um, he was arrested wrongfully for uh, alleged of stealing a book bag, um, something that could have cost maybe $30, um, but went to one of the toughest jails in not just New York, but in this, this country, uh, and uh, sent to Rikers uh, allegedly for a felony, uh, which you only have 90 days to uh, find and convict someone but he ended up staying there three years, uh, not of his own will. Uh, they said that he did something. He alleged that he never did, or he uh, attested he never did. Um, two of those years in solitary confinement, uh, Khalif went from a child that played Dragon Ball, watched Dragon Ball, played uh, Monopoly with us and our family, and uh, all the childhood things that we all have done at 15 and below. Um, to then going to Rikers Island where uh, he had to protect himself, fend for himself, and defend against not just the people on Rikers, which are s separated into two, the guards and the, um, the different, uh, the people that were there uh, that are not uh, staff, uh, as well as defend on the other end his liberty and justice to have a speedy trial or to get out as a free person that he should have been, uh, alleged of a crime that he never did. Um, Khalif did make it out. After the three years, they decided that they would release him. Uh, all charges dropped. Uh, Khalif did not come home the same, though. Khalif was not the playful Dragon Ball Z uh, character um, that we knew known him to be. Um, that being said, Khalif couldn't have come back home because he was tortured. He was starved uh, on Rikers Island every four days. And what we did to understand how he did it, we did a documentary um, in which we uh, FOIL requested the court for the video records. So Khalif could say he was starved, but how many of us could find out that's truth is because there was video footage uh, of him not getting fed uh, four days in a row, and or four meals, I'm sorry, let me correct that, four meals in a row, and on the fifth meal, uh, what they would give him was a tray of cabbage and a box of, or a carton of milk. Um, and in some of those instances, he didn't even want to eat that. 
Uh, this being said, that's just one form of torture. They, they allowed him to uh, linger without medical treatment or uh, mental health treatment. Um, and he requested for this. And so what happens with solitary confinement, as we all know, there are degradations to your humanity and to your sanity. And so he attempted suicide on several occasions, seven to be exact. Uh, and yet the guards would watch him and we would see from, again from the video footage. Um, that being said, Khalif committed suicide when he came home. After a year of being home, uh, which he did, I mean, th the unthinkable in our family's opinion, he got his GED on the first try. He was, a, he was very smart, very educated, and wanted to continue learning. And when he came home, he wanted to catch up with his classmates uh, and with society. So he wanted to get a job. He wanted to finish school. He got his GED on the first try, as I said, and then went to college and uh, pursued getting a business degree. But even as a 3.68 GPA student, um, which is pretty hard to do, especially just for a person who's never been in jail, um, uh, dealing with just the things that happen in our community, to can have that focus, Khalif was showing that he could do it. But the things that he suffered on Rikers really got to him to the point where he uh, inevitably, as I said, committed suicide. It didn't help that they were also giving him uh, on Rikers Respiritol, which has a 17% risk factor of, uh, if given to a person between the age of 16 to 24, has a 17% risk factor of suicide. Mm -hmm. Why would you give that? He's obviously between 17 and six, uh, 24. Um, that being said, he, can, he did what that medication had intended uh, to do bet uh, to youth between 17 and 24, uh, if given to. So uh, Khalif did commit suicide. Uh, I, uh, in the years that he was suffering on Rikers and when he was home, I dedicated myself as an engineer. I went, I, I'm an engineer by trade. I ended up leaving that career field. I'm in the mental health field at the moment. Um, and what I did was make sure and ensure that Khalif's story uh, it's not only just heard, but brought what we feel uh, as a family uh, justice is. And that's not a check, that's not a, uh, it's not money, because it cannot bring my brother back, although there is a financial payment uh, that the government had to pay for the loss of, li uh, of Khalif's life. Um, that being said, I started a mental health organization called the Khalif Browder Foundation. We're a not-for-profit, 501c3. Uh, we work with youth and young adults that are at risk for suicidal tendencies, drug and alcohol uh, use, um, and anything uh, ranging that would put them at it at risk um, status. Truancy would be at risk. Uh, these youth that we work with have the same characteristics of Khalif. Young, needs uh, uh, resources, in need of resources, uh, especially not just limited to mental health resources, but program uh, f uh, financial literacy courses. I work with a uh, number of organizations throughout the city of New York. And just to sum this up, so I'm not speaking too long, my work is in equity, not just justice. We need equity for our communities in order to provide them with the resources instead of providing jails with the resources. Right now, currently in Rikers Island, per person per year on Rikers is 550,000 to house. That amount could be put towards college and educational programs for our communities. Thank you, Akeem. Um, so Judge, let me bring you into this conversation because you know, on the one hand, it's easy for academics like me to show these charts and uh, uh, sort of critique it and to talk about the harm it causes. But in the end, I think for all of us, uh, it's really what, what's sort of paramount is the what is to be done right. question, right? And you've been at the center of this in your uh, life as a uh, judge. It's a hugely complicated system, both with formal laws, but the operations of public defenders, prosecutors, judges. Um, there's no one in charge of the whole thing. I mean, how do we go about thinking about getting this curve down to really what is People have different opinions about what's right and just, but certainly it's not this. Thank you, Michael. That's the perfect question, I believe. How do we go about thinking about it? But before I go further, uh, 
Hakeem, what happened to your brother should have never happened. And very hard for me to sit here and listen to you tell that entire story. I just couldn't just dive into the conversation without mentioning that. As far as how to think about it, uh, we, we, need, we need complex thinking. And, and just to kind of to kind of start at the beginning, um, in terms of where I am on this right now, after I started as a police officer in 1979 as a rookie cop on a foot post in Queens and my entire life since then, including now, was involved one way or the other with the criminal justice system. Rikers has always been a problem. You know, it's always been a problem. It's always gonna to continue to be a problem. I'm gonna give some straight talk. You know, I'm not a judge anymore. I'm a retired judge. I'm giving you my honest views. I'm not here to defend any institution one way or the other, just to share my honest viewpoint. You know, we've got a bill out there. Rikers is gonna be closed. We got the city council and de Blasio at the end of his second term. You know, they all took the bows. Rikers is closing. We signed this historic bill. They got some contracts. and. They're doing some building and they're gonna build these 32 or 3300. Let me say something from the beginning. Not happening, not happening. The number they came up with, the 32 to 3300 number, in my opinion, was an artificially low number from the beginning. I remember the days when we had 22,000 on Rikers and, and I was part of a team and there's a lot of things, nothing is perfect, but a lot of the policies and practices we put in New York City in place over the last 40 years, what got this Rikers population down about 70%. You know, I remember the days when we had 2,300 murders in New York. Now, by sitting at 2017 and uh, uh, 2018, we, we were down under 300. And it was, the com it was those huge drops in crime that was directly related to the huge drops in the Rikers population. Somehow things got mixed up and, and some people think that, yeah, they were dropping crime, but they weren't getting the jail population and the state prison population down. No, 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 not, not true. So these things have to correlate. And as long as crime's going up, the population's going up. That's a simple truth. And we have a plan right now that I think that the 32 to 3300 number was based more on a budget consideration than a real data-based data analysis. That if I could snap my fingers now and every one of those local sites was available tomorrow, we still need close to 3,000 beds on Rikers. So Rikers isn't going away in anybody's, I don't, I don't wanna say anybody's lifetime, but I would say like at least the next 10 years, or more. So I think, having said all that, if we're gonna deal with the issues Hakeem was, Hakeem was speaking about humanely, I, I believe it's time for the receivership on Rikers Island. I just believe that. It's a position that uh, the Legal Aid Society has taken in the recent case in front of the a federal judge. And um, I think that the reason I believe that, and this is not a criticism of Mayor Adams or the current administration. I go back to the Koch administration. So, so it's not an individual. I think administrations, and I, I worked for several mayors and several police commissioners, they, they tend to like, you know, want to, they, they don't want to kind of give up authority to the federal government. I understand that. They don't want to be on, on my watch. But, but the thing about a receivership is then the federal government would have the ability to make determinations on the contract rules, on the unlimited sick, here's the budget, here's the standards, what can we, something I've believed for a long time. I think that Rikers should be a Bellevue satellite. And I was on Rikers in the mental health ward. I went regularly as a judge. I was in the mental health ward about a year ago and walking around, talking to the, and, and, the, and, and, and the, the people who were in there, the inmates, they would, they would tell them, how they actually let me walk around, and I did. They, they said, this is great, you know. I said, well, but the only way they were getting there is they had to violate. They said, judge, we shouldn't have to violate. We should get good care. And then I was talking to the workers on Rikers, and they were telling me about medical care, 
about prescription medication, how difficult it is. They got to take the people out. They got to transport them to Bellevue. They got to bring them back. That's a huge deal on Rikers Island. So I said to them, what if you were a Bellevue satellite? What if you had the certification and you could treat people right here? They said, judge, advocate for us. I'm doing that tonight. So I think for starters, we got to get our feet on the ground. And, and this is in a, a, a left-wing position or a right-wing position. It's just to me, it's objectively what makes this most sense. And accept the fact that island isn't closing anytime soon. And what do we need to do to make it safe? And humane. And treat mental health. In terms of court processing, uh, I'll tell you one thing. I mean, that, that's a big chart, and you see a lot, of, a lot of numbers. But the one that I see is the last, the last three years that's straight up. I'm going to give you another report from the front. I was the supervising judge in Bronx criminal court when the pandemic hit. I was running the criminal court literally out of my basement. And then I became the administrative judge of Queen Supreme criminal term. The, the pandemic backlogs just, just went fine because we weren't doing trials. If you don't do trials, it isn't that you're not just doing trials as a criminal justice system. Guess what? If there's no trial capacity, there's no pleas. If there's no pleas and there's no trials and people are facing rapes and heavy robberies and manslaughters and homicides, they're, they're, staying, on, they're staying on Rikers Island. Then the third thing happened. We had the 2019 criminal justice reform. Now the goals of the reform minimize cash bail, if not try and find a way to eliminate cash bail, uh, more equitable, more equitable discovery rules. Who could argue with that? But the process, the process was a fatally flawed process. In, okay, well, I'm just saying what I think. No, 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 I, okay. believe me. I, want me. I'll I, stop if I, you I, want. Well, I just, I just want to make sure to get Janet into right. the okay. conversation. All right, I, I wasn't I, being comprehensive I, I, enough. I, I, so. I, I, don't, I don't want you to not I'll, I'll say pick, what I'll you... I'll pick up where I left I don't off. want you not say what you think, and we, we, could, we could have another panel on the Rikers well, Island. I think it all ties oh, in. They, okay. No, I get it. But it let, let me... Um, but I'm going to... And Jen and I have discussed this before. I mean, this... This is, in a lot of ways, clearly, as we have this panel on, this is a very consequential issue, as both Akeem and Judge Grosh were laying out, and, and it, it implicates the, the lives of people and their families on Rikers and conditions on Rikers. Um, and to me, one of the frustrations has always been, it, it's been very difficult, certainly for someone like me, and I have no expertise in this, to, to make this, to try to get it to be a more public issue, in the same way that sort of bail reform is a public issue, and you understand why that's a public issue. But this, this has always seemed like in, sort of inside baseball, the provenance of experts, and you know, why does it really matter about case processing and how long people stay? And I guess, Jan, the question for you is someone someone who reports on these issues all the time and the consequences of these. I mean, how do, how do you think about that or what advice do you have for folks who um, are, are working on this, uh, certainly like Akeem, how, how, do, how do you raise the profile of this issue so that the general public kind of gets this is, this is not just a narrow policy issue, this is an important, very basic issue of justice. How, what is to be done there? No, thank you. I think that's a great question. And I think a lot of it is the onus is on, you know, the media to recognize that this is a serious situation um, and that it's all tied into what's happening on Rikers. Um, I think, you know, speaking for the Times, that we've done a relative good job outlining that, um, particularly when we talk about um, the issues in the Bronx in 2013 with the huge um, backlog in cases. Um, there was this major investigation by the Times then that led to a lot of the changes that we saw happening from that point on where um, Judge uh, Chief Judge Jonathan Litt Littman, the previous chief judge, um, implemented a number of changes that led to um, judges having to be more stricter with their calendars, um, 
And there was even a recent project um, in Brooklyn about a year ago uh, where the Center for Court Innovation, um, you know, they uh, put one judge with a number of cases and, you know, had that judge stick to a very strict calendar. And so, for example, there are status meetings. And oftentimes these status meetings cause delays because they're, they're made one month and then the defense lawyer or prosecutors are not ready and it's further delayed. Um, so in this particular pilot program, they made it so that in between status hearings, people were meeting and connecting and talking and sharing information to make sure that cases were expedited. Um, so that's like an example. But um, for the media, uh, you know, I think it's critically important for us to focus on this. People are dying, right? Um, 18 people dead so far this year. This is the highest in nearly a decade, um, which is really profound when you think about the population being half of what it was um, then. Um, and so, you know, the circumstances here mean that, you know, people could die if they're not, um, if their cases aren't processed and also, I think someone on the panel mentioned um, issues of self-harm, which have skyrocketed um, during the pandemic. And I think it's no um, coincidence that that likely ties into people sitting in jail longer at a time when the jails are, you know, continually um, in crisis. Um, you still have a shortage of staff, uh, which you know means that you know when people are in need, when they need to get some medical, when they need food, when there's a fight going on, um, you know there are not enough people there to break it out, break it up, and and provide safety and supervision. Um, and I don't know if we have time, because I know we're, we were all chatting very long, but <laughs> I wanted to actually highlight what I think was a, a example of what you're talking about. Um, and so when it comes to the advice question you mentioned, I think it's great for, you know, um, organizations like the one that you run to, you know, reach out to reporters and kind of provide that human aspect that speaks to the issue. And so I think this is an example of it. Um, I wanted to, I guess, highlight um, an example of a case delay. This is Gilberto Garcia. He was the 18th person to die on Rikers this year, um, earlier this month. Uh, he had been on Rikers for three years, uh, so since 2019, uh, waiting for trial on a robbery case, which was nowhere near being wrapped up. Um, and so he was arrested Halloween day in 2019, then arraigned in November, arraigned in Supreme Court in December and March, on two separate indictments. He appeared in court again in April and his case was adjourned because um, now we're in October 2020. Um, and so his case was adjourned at this time because of COVID. And as you mentioned, trials were not happening. So this particular year, um, from April to December, there were nine trials. So when you think about the profound impact that has on the court system that compared to 2019, when there were 800 trials a year, that's a huge difference. Um, and so that brings me back to Mr. Garcia, who over the next two years, um, his case continues to be delayed because prosecutors aren't ready, defense lawyers aren't ready, he has cold defendants who aren't ready. Um, then there's another delay because they can't figure out how to get everyone in the same courtroom in the midst of COVID. Um, and so the delays continue and brings us up to this year of February, uh, where everyone signaled they were ready to proceed. But still nothing happened until June when the judge finally made a motion, uh, made a ruling on a motion. Um, and then after that, he was not due back into court until December 9th, but of course he has been dead for a month. And so, you know, I think when we talk about case delays, a huge question is the role of everyone involved, judges, prosecutors, defense lawyers, um, and even the Department of Correction, which at times uh, fails to bring people to court, which is something I've definitely seen in the midst of my reporting. Um, but I think I've been rambling a bit. <laughs> Well, let, let me, let me before I, and I, I, I want to ask Judge Grosso to talk specifically about some of those system issues and how to change them, but let me circle back to Akeem quickly, because you, certainly more than anyone else here, you yourself, your organization, right, you're on the ground, you're working on these issues, um, and I don't know if you have the same, and they're, they're uh, obviously your brother's story, this story, I mean, they're so heartbreaking. Um, you know, how, how do you sort of raise 
the, the, not just the profile of individual cases, but this issue of, of length of stay and how long you stay and procedural issues and, and put a, a, a sort of face on it to, to get more public support behind reform. How do, you, how do you think about that and how do you do that? It is complicated uh, when it comes to organizations like mine, Exodus Transitional Services, Youth Justice Network, uh, these organizations, they struggle to one, not only just find the finances, um, because re if we were to allocate finances uh, that are being routed to government facilities like Rikers Island, um, and we're talking 50, uh, uh, 550,000 just on uh, general housing stays on Rikers for one year per person. That's not uh, including the amount that's uh, allocated for solitary confinement. All, this, all these fundings could be used uh, for organization, community-based organizations that have that relationship with the youths, the youths in under, uh, underfunded and disenfranchised communities. And so what we do, um, instead of trying to spend our time on highlighting, which we really need to have uh, more focus from the news because that's what starts investigations, that's what starts looking into why our use, our, our use in these communities are not uh, are not being uh, or capable of having uh, the same as other wealthier communities. Uh, so what we do, we focus on one mitigation services. Uh, how do we mitigate so that we can help judges uh, get a clear wraparound service uh, or wraparound um, uh, about this one youth uh, in particular or any of them? Uh, so we mitigate so that the judge, like. Uh, like the judges can have a full um, uh, perspective of this youth. What brought that person to this, uh, this allegation? Uh, where, what is the community's take? Because realistically, if the community is safe with the person returning home on a nonviolent charge, which is what we advocated for, not having non or having nonviolent charges not stay on Rikers. If you're, not, if you're considered nonviolent, why are you on, you're not a threat to anyone. But there's that in, that in between of where we were talking about bail and not having people uh, have to afford to get out of jail, where we could have someone who is dangerous to the community, like Harvey Weinstein, uh, but yet he can bail, he can afford to get bailed out. Where we have someone nonviolent for allegedly stealing a book bag, like Khalif Browder, stay in jail because he cannot afford having a book bag. That's just bail. But when we do have someone uh, home that has afforded bail or is, we are on Rikers as well, uh, and creating programs for social emotional learning so that we can actually uh, speak to these issues of mental health on Rikers or on the streets. We just don't get enough uh, recognition. What, the, what we have to inevitably do is uh, get to the point where we can have uh, not just funding, but real wraparound services that touches the families, not just, I mean, we talk about people on Rikers that's arrested and their families on Rikers. There's not families on Rikers. They're us, our community. We're the families in ho at home. How is it affecting the community by having this person away that is nonviolent? Right. Thank you. So, uh, Judge, let me circle back to you because the, the, the we, we could probably have an interesting argument on another time about the size of Rikers or closing Rikers, but, but regardless of whether Rikers closes or not, whether the population is 6,000 or 3,000, these issues, the length of stay issues are just apparent no matter where you are in this debate. And as, as you said, there it's incredibly complex, as Jan was saying, and it, it, invo the, it involves a really complicated system, the actions of judges and prosecutors and legal aid attorneys. And you know, this system has been, uh, it, it, uh, ex is existed for years and years, and, and you need to change it. And it's easy, again, for people like me to say that, but you've been in a position where you can see it and have a thought about how to change it. How do you change how cases are processed and, and, and get to any notion of a speedy disposition of justice? Yeah. So Jan mentioned um, when we had the backlog of cases over a year old in the Bronx. I know a lot about that because I'm the one who fixed it. Uh, judge Di Fiore, when she became chief judge in January of 16, was, uh, as you know, because the Times did a phenomenal report on it, was hit with a class action lawsuit. 
I got that job in June of 2016, and we had roughly somewhere between 23 and 2,400 cases over a year old, misdemeanor cases. By the time the pandemic hit, I was still the chief, the supervising judge there. We were down to, uh, in 2019, we were down to 133. And uh, most, of, and most of that, we were, we were down in under a thousand in a matter of six months. We were in the 500 range in about a year. We had to move cases. I took over. I created the trial capacity where we didn't have one. I had a stakeholders meeting with the defense attorneys, with the DAs, you know, with everybody, service providers, all that, and said, we're moving cases. And I drove them. I took the old case part. And I pushed a lot of cases out. I made a trial Friday. And we were able to get these cases and dig into these cases and use the authority of the court, which can be considerable, to get cases in the trial posture. But I was starting to say, when I was talking about the, 20, the 2019 so-called uh, criminal justice reform, it's known as bail reform, but it was criminal justice reform, and it dealt with discovery. Theoretically, the discovery system that we had previously had a ton of problems. They were absolutely right to take that on. Trial by ambush, the DA can just show up the day of trial and hit somebody and hit a defense attorney with hundreds and thousands of pages and here you go, pick the jury. But they rushed it through and this is a problem. It's a systemic problem in our system and if we're gonna have a conversation about this, we have to talk about the root, a root cause that they take these they, meaning the, the, the party with the power, which right now is the Democratic Party, and they ram through legislation in the budget process. They didn't reach out to judges like me. They didn't reach, they didn't really care a lot with people like David Soares, a very well-respected uh, district attorney in Albany County. And they, they came up with these rules, certificates of completion. What this meant, just for time-saving purposes, is in each case, Thousands of documents have to be electronically transferred from DAs to defense bar. It's immense. Among other things, it was an unfunded mandate. They gave them the job. They didn't give them the funding so you could have technology that coincides between DAs and defense and that the DAs could staff up properly. So what does that mean to me as a judge? Well, I can fast forward that. So now I'm the administrative judge in, in, in Queens, walking in the door in August of 21, and everything's backed up, and you've got all of these COC and discovery rules, and you've got to sort them out. And, and there's a chaos because of the way the law was written. When you rush it through like that, and you don't take the proper time, and you don't build in all the stakeholders, and then do it, it inevitably creates problems. So on the legal front, We've got cases that are all over the place, all over New York, where judges are going one way, where what's it, one judge says a certificate of completion is good, the other one says a certificate of completion isn't good. So when I want to take judges, and when I'm supervising judges and say, look, we've got these backlogs, we want to get these cases to trial, you know, we're working in, in a bit of a minefield. And, and it isn't, in a lot of people, they focus on that the prosecutors are quitting, this is all publicly reported. But on the defense end, some of the institutional defender, the leaders of the institutional defenders, you know, were, a lot of them were kind of pushing for this law, so they don't like to say it publicly, but I can tell you, in the field, in the trenches, the defense lawyers are going crazy too, because they have to be put in a position now, where are they gonna find? This is New York City. They got dozens if not hundreds of cases. You got thousands of documents per case. You gotta always be worried if you do a plea and you haven't looked at everything, it could be a problem down the road. So not only does this current system that we have slow down the ability of judges to get cases up and ready for trial where both sides are actually ready, it tends to undercut the ability to get pleas. And if we can't get pleas, it's the way the system works. Why do we want works. them to plea out? Huh? Why do we not, want to, uh, them to plea? No, this, this is what we're saying. Okay. We, we need to get to the point where we can have pleas. You know, m almost all of the, uh, the cases in New York, especially Queens County, okay. is all on pleas. Okay. 
How many trials do they even get to do before pr- right, pandemic? Well, it's a, it's one. A, okay. Okay. I mean, how many how many trials are they really? Tell me doing? when you're going to let me respond, okay, okay, and right. then I'll respond. When, when you want judge, me to respond, yeah, judge, I'll actually. So, respond. Judge, why don't you respond yeah. quickly, and then I want to I want to yeah. give Jan the yeah. last word okay. before we get to the audience. Okay. Okay. I'll tell you why, Akeem, because it's an economy of scale. There are thousands of cases. They all can't realistically go to trial. So everyone now, can't they, get justice. Are you going to keep interrupting me? Okay, gonna let, let yeah, me let, are you going to let me answer? Let the I mean, judge can, answer, I mean, and then we'll pick this You can just we'll, have a we'll conversation with yourself, okay. <laughs> you can let me answer. Well, I, mean, I am. So it's an economy of scale. We have thousands of cases. Obviously, you can't try all of them. So it's the system of pleas or dismissal. If the cases, if the cases aren't good, if they're not strong, they can be dismissed. But if, you, if we're going to think that we can try every case in the New York City criminal justice system, you no, again, them. you're interrupting me. Okay, well, okay, thank, let, thank you very let, much. Let, yeah, let, you know? Why don't we finish then, yeah. Judge, yeah. Judge, yeah. Why don't you, why don't you let Judge Grasso finish? Yeah. Okay, you no, might really. not like the I mean, We're not in the All courtroom. Right. Yeah. Okay. Why, 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 don't, why, don't we, why don't we finish up so, and then we'll, we'll, it, it, we'll the continue The conversation is back and forth. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't interrupting you, my friend. Okay. I know. Okay. All right. I have to interrupt. Okay. Yeah. Judge, why don't you finish up and then we'll... As I was saying... As I was saying, the bottom line is it's an economy of scale. And we've got to bring, if we can't bring cases to the point where they're resolvable, either by disposition or we're scheduling them for trial, or the district attorney is deciding to dismiss because the DA doesn't think they have the case. It's like picture a traffic jam in the Midtown Tunnel when you got one lane out. What's that look like? That's what the criminal justice system looks like. Okay. Thank you. Okay, okay. Now, let me, let me, I, I, I want to save like 10 or 15 minutes for questions from the audience, but let me ask you, Jan, just for a minute to sort of look into the future a second, because on the one hand, we all, we seem to be in a moment now of sort of criminal justice reform. There's obviously a lot of public talk and rhetoric about this. Some of it's pretty toxic, um, but still a lot of attention to it a huge amount of attention to Rikers and the conditions on Rikers and yours and other reporting about it. You know, are we in, I mean, can you imagine from all this attention some some good coming out of the other end of of this? I mean, is there some reason, there's all sorts of reasons to be pessimistic. Um, I mean, are there reasons, do you think, from talking to all the folks you talk to to be hopeful? You know, I wish I could say something in the affirmative. Um, You know, a lot of what we're seeing on Rikers has been decades in the making, rooted in policies approved by mayor after mayor, going back to Lindsay. Um, And so you got to wonder what's going to give. And, you know, if there is this thinking that one commissioner can change it, um, you know, based on my reporting and based on speaking with people, that's just not the case. It, it takes more than that because it is um, so rooted in a culture that has existed for so long and that's, you know, passed on when a new class of officers comes in. Um, and so, you know, how do you crack into that and sort of change that is like the big question. Um, and even the federal monitor can't do it alone and the federal government and you know um, a lot of people have been calling for a federal receiver and you know yes you know that federal receiver could you know come in and just do his or her thing without having to worry about the local politics or the unions Um, but then there's a question of you know if that person needs funding for something will they get it from the legislature Um, so I, I don't know the answer Okay. Sorry. All right. Well, yeah. No, I, I appreciate it. And it's it's uh, not a fair question. If we're if okay. I can if I can yeah, answer but, but please just be quick. So I want to get the audience. Yeah, I'll be real yeah, quick. Okay. If we're thinking about it on a financial scale, which yes, it takes money to run these on uh, these systems, but we also have to we have to have a rubric for human life, mm. and when we're trying to look at whether we need trials or pleas uh, to convict a person, what is their right? Their right is to be um, brought to justice. Justice cannot be served in plea bargains because we have a lot of cases that's being overturned because they were wrongfully pled or they were forced to take a plea bargain. I myself fell into that. And that's why I don't believe in these plea bargains because in 2019, I was wrongfully incarcerated. They tried to lie and say that I was the person and try to get me to take a plea. And when I did not take a plea, 
then the video so what do you that suggest? it wasn't even me. What do you suggest? What do you suggest? Oh, wait, wait. Let's before, just release it. Before, before, okay. What, yeah. Can I make it's a easy to criticize, I, but I'd like I, to know what you suggest. Can I, wait, can I make a suggestion? People. Because, okay. I mean, some of us can stay afterwards, and it, I, I think it, it, it probably, this is a, a long discussion, and I think we should make time for it, but I, I do want to make sure um, we get to at least a few questions from the audience. Uh, I can't really see. Oh, okay. um, yeah, go ahead. Go. I'm sorry. Okay, thanks so much. Um, first of all, I want to sincere condolences to the Browder family, and it's really wonderful that your, your activism is a tribute to your brother. Um, let me follow the judge here and say this is not intended as a left-wing or a right-wing question, but in my I'm not a lawyer. My understanding is that there, in a case, there's all sorts of tactical reasons why either the prosecution or the defense might seek delays, which a judge may or may not grant. And, and, and in other words, it, it could be the case that a defense attorney might say to a, their client, listen, I know it sucks. You've been on Rikers for two years. They offered us a trial. I'm trying to string this out because if we would have gone to trial, I think you'd be doing 20, 30 years upstate. So it's not just that the system is denying people trials, right? There's, ta there's a chess game going on, if I'm not mistaken. You, know, you, you, you absolutely nailed it. And, and in answering your question directly, I want to be very clear that this is not in any way, shape, or form a knock on defense attorneys. Defense attorneys have a job to do. And I think by, by and large, our institutional services in New York and, and even and our 18B panel, I think they deserve a lot of credit. I've seen them firsthand. And yes, that is a tactic. As in fact, many, the story behind the story is many of the oldest cases on Rikers aren't going to trial because the defense attorney is doing everything she or he can not to get it for trial because they think, and I'm speaking in the abstract here, their client is guilty of sin. If they go to trial, they're gonna lose. They're gonna face X, Y, and Z, but maybe, just maybe, if they kick it down the road six months or a year or even two years, maybe three, Witnesses, people may, you know, not be around anymore for a whole variety of reasons. They may get a stronger case. There'll be a new ADA. Maybe the cop or the detective will retire. So that is common practice. And it's within the bound. Now, that's where, where judges are supposed to come in and where I would, I would go over with my judges the backlogs and I would bring them in every case over a year old. And the j judge's job is to try and break through that and push through, and oftentimes we can, but, but not all the time. And then just to loop back to what I was saying about the 2019 legislation, uh, uh, great goal, horrible execution. What I believe is we need a special session in Albany as soon as possible, clean slate on bail reform, discovery reform, get everybody to the table, and don't rush it through on a one-party power play. And, and let, me, let me just add one thing before I go to the next question. And, and the, the judge gave an example of, of why on the defense there are incentives to delay, but it's, the, the, the reason this is such a tough issue is it's true, but it's also true for the prosecution, yes, right? I mean, you. we have a local legal culture here. That, this is the issue with this. It's so complicated. The, the, the defense bar has a reason to delay for all the reasons you as said, does as does the DA, right? And prosecutors like, can like delay because someone's in, you know, they're ripening them up for a plea. Yes. Uh, they're more likely to dispose of the case the longer someone's in if you offer them a plea to get out. So it's the, there are all these institutional incentives that at some level are all kind of perverse. And I agree with you, Judge. It, in, in the end, it's the judge that has to break through this because the, the, the fact is there are strong interests in delay from all sides. And it's really in some ways, and this is the heart of the matter for me, it's, it's on the judiciary to break through that, and not everyone is a Judge Grasso, you know, and, and I, I don't, I don't want to take up the time talking here because I want to make sure we get the audience in, but, but it is, it, that, that delay issue, that incentive exists across the system, and I'm, I, I think there was another hand up, yeah, you, and then, and then, and then maybe we'll end here, but go, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'm a retired CEO from a very large company, and I would like to ask uh, if anyone can um, 
explain how it costs five hundred and thirty thousand dollars per inmate <laughs> to run Rikers Island. Yeah. Uh, well, br briefly, I, 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 I can. <laughs> it's a very good question. It's complicated. Um, the, the the fact is, New York City, which is ironic, New York City has the most richly staffed jail system in the world. There's no system that has the resources that New York does, not, not in terms of staff, money, right? New York, New, the city jail system, as you're all hearing, has an incredible number of problems. Money is not one of them. So the reason, the answer to your question is because the, the ratio of staff to people who are incarcerated is almost two to one. That is, there are two staff people to every person who's incarcerated. More than half of those people are uniformed officers. They make an incredible amount of money. It's a hard job. I don't, I don't begrudge them that. Um, uh, at, and so those salaries and that staffing ratio lead to that cost. And you, it's a fair question to ask, not why does it cost so much, because when you do the math, if you have that much staff for those few people incarcerated, you're going to get these costs. But at least in theory, Right, if you're going to spend half a million dollars or more, yeah. you should have an unbelievable system. You know, one that takes care of people where people are safe, that gives them programs, that they, that continue on. Anyhow, it's the, the easy answer is because of the huge number of staff, two staff to every person incarcerated. Even Norway, the most iconic system in the world, does not have anywhere near that staff, that's, that's the easy answer to your question. But also yeah. to jump in, um, just poor deployment of staff, right? So they have yes. officers doing things that civilians can do. They have officers as secretaries, officers working in the bakery, in the laundry room, oh. um, and so it's just a waste of, of resources. That's why, that's why I, I started out my remarks by saying, I think it's time for receivership. I mean, we've had, like I said, I've been around in the criminal justice system since the Koch administration. This is not a knock on any mayor, but we haven't gotten it right. It's insane. So let's let the federal government take a shot. Okay. And we gotta actually keep in mind, they say that 550,000 per person per year is to house them. So that means the staff, but also the food, which we know is not coming to that much. But we do have statistics for, or the, the numbers for how much health insurance and medical, uh, medical and dental, $7,000 per year per inmate is allocated for dental, and $7,500 7, uh, in that round, uh, no more than $8,000 is dedicated to your medical. That means medication, uh, uh, mental health services. It, that means the, mo the majority of it is going to, as he said, staffing. And that's not what we need for those people who will inevitably return back to our community to get back into the into the swing of things, they need that help. They need the services, but it's not provided. So let, let's let's take one final question. I, 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 I mean, I, right over here. Oh, was there one here too? Okay, yep, maybe one over there too. All right, two final questions. Uh, uh, but this is on when when yeah uh, yeah okay. Uh, you're never going to see me do one of these ever again. But that uh, yeah, go ahead. You're doing great, Michael. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you, all of you, and my condolences. Uh, and I'll just jump to part of your story, which touches me, and I sign petitions and show up for rallies. Solitary confinement. I mean, I, it, we look human in he here, all of us. How do we justify that? I mean, I, 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 just, I just have to ask that question. I mean, I'm, I realize there's much more to fi fix here, but I, how can we not get rid of this ASAP? How do, how do we justify that? We're still fighting to get solitary confinement banned because what they did was modified it. And a lot of people who are watching this, who inevitably will watch this, or those of you here now, please understand, by changing the name does not change the circumstance or the actual captivity. What they did was add a cell to the cell and said that they are getting out of their solitary confinement to be in a space where it's either one to two other people in another cell, just a little bit bigger, and then go right back into your cell. It's just a cell added on. This is still inhumane. We don't even treat animals. And to, to your point, yes, we are all human beings here, but they are, first of all, far removed 
only one way onto Rikers and one way off, and we are not allowed to go on there until they actually fix the scene so that when we go on there and report, then it looks and says the story that they want you to say. Judge, you want to make a final point, then we'll yeah. take the last question. I just have to say, I think it's a paradoxical issue. I was, I was a police officer, I was never a corrections officer. But I know a lot of terrific corrections officers, really good people who, who believe in humane treatment, who say if that tool is taken away from them, they have no other way in certain cases, in hardcore cases of maintaining discipline and protecting the cell block. I think the whole issue has to come down as to what is the most humane and realistic way. And I go back to a receivership. So let's see what the federal government can come up with. Are there best practices in, in other systems, in other cities, where it's shown to work and keep everybody safer? But corrections officers have a, look, Hakeem's, Hakeem's brother, what happened to him was horrific, but I know a lot of corrections officers who've been severely injured and hurt on that job. It's no picnic for them either. So these are tough, paradoxical issues, and I don't pretend to have an easy answer, but I had to add that as well. Um, okay, let's take the final question. Um, so you showed the graph at the beginning showing a spike in the time that people were spending on Rikers, which began before the pandemic. Was there a policy change that happened? Like, do we know concretely why this change started when it did? Well, I, I, it's an excellent question, and I, I feel some need to close us out, so I, I don't want to yammer on for a half hour about this. Um, you know, I think what's, what's important about that chart is you know, New York City has never had great case processing times. I mean, even before you saw that huge increase, um, you know, and, and the problem with that short is it looks like that baseline for the 10 years before was pretty good. It wasn't pretty good then, and it's, it's gotten worse. Um, and it's, it's, it's hard to know exactly why it's gotten worse, but there, but there is this um, culture of delay here that just rears its head at sort of historic periods, not clear exactly why it started. We're um, clear, it's money. When it, when it did, well, and maybe I'll, I'll also let the judge take a shot at this, because it's not, it's not like something all of a sudden changed in the system. There was no, you know, it, it, we're not talking about the discovery law or bail reform, right? This is 10. Or this, the unions. This is, right, but this is 10 years ago, right? So what, you know, what changed? It, and it's, 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 it's hard to know, but that's what makes this so difficult. There was no, you can't point to a big piece of legislation or some huge system change that, that you know, all of a sudden it took longer. And to me, it goes back, it's very hard to answer why. To me, it goes back to at the end of the day, it's really the judiciary that has to cut through this. Um, and, it, you know, for me, absent, you know, the individual judges who heroically try to move these cases, that's a failure of the court system, that, that line right there, because there's nothing that easily says, well, you know, here, he, here's, the, here's the reason. There, there, there was no reason. Judge, you, do you agree with that? Well, well, I do know, as I said, in my personal experience, I was able to take an entire, one of the most intractable courts in the system, Bronx Criminal Court, and over two years get like a 90% reduction right. in something that had been a problem for decades. Right. So I know, I know it could be done. Correct. Uh, uh, I'm not gonna wing it as to you know, why we're seeing the trend lines that we've seen since 2017, but I will reiterate, we also see that straight shot up over the last three years. What we're doing now isn't gonna fix it. Right. I'll end with that. Okay. So let me, I mean, clearly we can, we can talk more about this forever. I, I'm like four or five minutes over time, which I'm going to pay for, I know. Uh, um, but I, I really, I'd, I'd love to thank all our panelists who... Uh, <clears throat> uh,
who came and may, and, uh, and maybe if there's any interest, I, I don't want to volunteer anyone else's time, but I, I'm certainly happy to hang around and talk longer. And, but thanks to all the people who joined remotely and all of you, and hopefully we'll see some of you next week when this conversation continues. Thank you all. I, I don't mind taking any questions or even diving into more, but I will say when it comes to finances, the union for the Department of Corrections has had a heavy hand on why it's been always bad. I mean, the union has always had a 100 year contract. And so they're up, their contract is up and that's why they're fighting so hard to keep it and not let it get into uh, the federal monitors or the federal government's hand. But realistically, the, the, last, the last union president who's in jail or who, who's been locked up in federal, uh, federal holding because of embezzlement and money laundering and all these scandals is because he's fought to keep the union of the Department of Corrections and the officers, COBA, uh, Correctional Bene Benevolent Association, uh, to have more and more. And they've even protested in the street and said that they have the right to shut down New York if they're not heard. It's financial.